So good evening. May I have your attention, please? That worked pretty well, except for Michael Werner. That was good. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just. A... <laughs> Welcome to the ARM annual dinner and presentation, uh, previous presentation of the ARM Legislator of the Year Award. Uh, the regenerative medicine and advanced therapy industry continues to emerge as, uh, from the shadows into the global spotlight as the basis for a medical revolution that promises to change the way healthcare is delivered and indeed challenge our very expectations regarding the boundaries of our ability as an industry to reduce mortality from many diseases, decrease suffering, and improve the lives of patients everywhere. But this dinner is a celebration of how far we have come on this journey and a celebration of its stakeholders. We'll hear tonight from the perspective of representatives for those who are working to make it happen and those that have already realized the benefits of its promise, the patients. And we'll have the opportunity to acknowledge the support of one of our special officials for the hard work to help uh, legislative officials uh, to help uh, the hard work to help us fulfill our mission. On that note, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Nesson Birmingham as an outstanding representation of the group that is making it happen. Nesson, a sitting board member of ARM since 2016, is CEO, president, and founder of Intellia Therapeutics, a company cutting at the bleeding edge of gene modification and one of the first CRISPR-Cas9 companies to complete an IPO. He's an entrepreneur and investor, most recently a partner at Atlas Ventures, and the person whose vision and drive qualified Intellia for award recognition as one of the top 10 startups in 2010 and a fierce biotech company. With a strong investment background, Nesson co-founded several healthcare and biotech startups and was previously CEO of Tal Medical, a medical device company that was spun out of Harvard Medical School. With that rich and varied background, Nesson will no doubt continue to contribute to society through his work in this industry. Please join me in welcoming Nesson tonight. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Pretty, uh, for the introduction and the opportunity to speak to such a distinguished audience during such an important week for ARM. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For all of us, there are things in life we love to do. Things that are what we may say define us as an individual, from reading a particular author or genre, to knitting a sweater, to building a car. As we do these things, we may reflect on what has enabled us to do them. We may think about our upbringing, our friends, but ultimately it is the DNA that encodes us that is the primary driver. For me, it is sports. I run marathons, I box, I relish the speed of downhill stretches on a snowboard and mountain bike. I push myself to the extreme and I'm driven to endure after others may have given up. When I reach the point where giving up seems to be the only reasonable thing to do, it is the patience that we aim to cure that motivate me to the finish. When I climb a hill in the final stages of a marathon, I push through because I know that my lungs will never have to fight harder for oxygen than those patients living with alpha-1 lung disease. When I step into the boxing ring, I'm fearless because I know that I will not experience the pain children with sickle cell disease fear every day. When continuing the race demands that I choose to suffer, I remind myself that it is by my choice and that I will never face the choice between a preventative double mastectomy and living under the sword of breast cancer. I'm tough and I've spent a lifetime pushing myself to endure without throwing in the towel. But tonight, I'm telling you that I'm giving up my career in healthcare because I'm not tough enough to care for people with genetic disorders 
with the current treatment paradigms. I am not tough enough for health care if the best we can do is to advise couples with sickle cell trait to think carefully before having children. I am not tough enough for health care because I could never tell a young woman that she has the same genetic mutation that killed her mother by breast cancer and that cutting away her healthy tissue is the best we can do for her. I am not tough enough to watch children with alpha-1 battle for breath, forcing them, themselves to endure until transplant lungs, if transplant lungs become available. I admire the compassion, skills, and dedication of our healthcare professionals who are prepared to take care of people living with serious genetic disorders. I admire them not only for what they do, but for persevering despite the frustration of being able to care, but not to cure. I admire healthcare professionals. I share their frustration. And like them, I cannot be content with the healthcare we can offer patients living with genetic diseases anymore. Neither is Intelia, the company that I'm proud to be a founder of and to lead. And I dare speak for the audience, neither are you. However, we are not turning our backs on patients or the children they simultaneously hope and fear to have. To the contrary, we are shaking off the shackles that restrict health care and replacing it with the potential of health cure. A new paradigm where freedom from genetic disorders is no longer an inherited privilege. And in Telia, we believe the genes, for example, causing transtyrethin amyloidosis, can and should be corrected before the disease manifests itself in the patient. Hepatitis B can be cured. Inborn errors of metabolism can be fixed. It is a realistic choice for us to make. 14 years after the completion of the Human Genome Project, we have reached the point where we will soon not need to ask doctors and patients to rely on new medicines only because they worked in others in a cohort study. Instead, we begin to offer patients with genetic disorders true precision medicine, personalized to their individual genome or genetic makeup. As scientists, we've been honored to witness the development of the technologies that will soon allow us the potential to cure genetic-based disease, a one-and-done treatment paradigm. We've seen the birth of regenerative medicine, a field of study that, until recently, sounded like a contradiction in terms. But today, we are proud to follow in the footsteps of ARM's visionaries founders. It is realistic to turn from health care and toward health cure. But that does not mean that it will be easy. Curative therapies will require a nimble approach in building large pipelines of drugs with rapid, safe translation from the laboratory to the clinic. The range of issues, the range of issues is vast and vexing. How do we rationalize clinical trials without compromising patient safety? How do we train our doctors, not only those who study today, but also those who acquired their knowledge before new technologies emerged? Regulatory bodies are thoughtful about new therapeutic approaches and have shown willingness to enter a new age of medicine. How do we empower them with knowledge they have never needed before and the capital to support the implementation of these approaches? These questions are tough, but answering them is urgent. Inequitable access to medicines kills as surely as disease does, and we all need the indomitable will of pioneers to find a cure for a chronically ailing healthcare system. But, ladies and gentlemen, of your will I feel assured. I've not met all of you, but I know you, because I see you in the halls and laboratories of Intelia and other biotechnology companies every day. You are the distinguished doctor who lost the mother of their child to a genetic disease. You are a scientist who relies on your brain, but knows that Alzheimer's robs your family of mental acuity. You are the entrepreneur who grasps at scientific progress because you live in a world where even the most sophisticated medicines are often too crude and disease too cruel to be content with these healthcare paradigms. Whether you are a scientist, legislator, or patient, I know you because we share a vision that unites ARM 
compassionate professionals and legislative leaders. But is our confidence misplaced? Well, have we not lived to see the internet democratize access to information? Why would we not doubt that genetic data will drive the establishment of a health cure democracy where heritable disorders no longer enslave patients no matter their socioeconomic level? Why should we, the Amazon.com generation, doubt that cures can be delivered at a point of life rather than a point of care? We are not unrealistic. I know we will run the race to health cure step by step. First, we may only be able to knock out one disease-causing gene at a time. Initially, general practitioners will probably send patients with suspected genetic disorders to specialists who will confirm the diagnosis, order personalized treatment, and administer it intravenously, possibly in a hospital setting. Patients will likely be required to go for follow-up visits to confirm that the treatment has worked. It will still be cumbersome, but we will soon save lives. We will not allow early success, however, to make us content. Under the appropriate regulatory framework, we may see our grandchildren's cheeks swabbed shortly after birth to create genetic profiles that could form a personalized treatment paradigm for their entire lives. And even if we do not immediately have a genetic cure, we will be able to keep patients informed as and when treatments become available. The cost of a genetic profile is now approaching as little as $100. Who dares to say that we cannot afford it? In a country where the average citizen today spends more than 10,000 per year on health care, we can. Surely we can provide a one stop cure for less than the cost of a lifetime of chronic treatment. But why stop there? If you have your genetic data in the cloud, why shouldn't you be able to order a genetic cure online? As more of our chronic medicines are becoming home delivered, who is to say that the health cure industry? cannot be part of the online economy. Let me make a prediction tonight. In our lifetime, whole genome individual sequencing will become standard, with personalized medicines being manufactured and shipped to point of care, or point of cure. No different to drugs like Humira or Crescentix, which are shipped to parents' doorsteps, patients' doorsteps, and self-injected, are the online personalization of a pair of Converse sneakers that are subsequently manufactured and shipped to your door. Dreams, yes. But it is dreams that fuel the passion that drive us to work harder. You don't only have the right to dream, but it is your duty as a leader to be a visionary. Let us not be naive about the challenges we are bound to face. The race to health cure will be a marathon, not a sprint. We will have to take knocks. We will have to persevere in the face of setbacks. And we will have to stand up to those who will stand in our, and more importantly, patients' way. There are those of us, or there are those who are not only privileged enough to be satisfied with the status quo, but powerful enough to stand in the way of progress. Let us not underestimate them. Senator Murray, Congressman Upton, the legislation you and your staffs worked so hard to pass inspire us and the patients we serve. Do not give up. Continue true leadership and make sure that it can be implemented effectively. Let's remind Washington and the world that an investment in science today is an investment in society, not only for today, but for the 21st century and beyond. The 21st Century Cures Act must be implemented successfully because it not only allows us to develop new science, but to move beyond healthcare paradigm of treatments to find cures. That is what our arm is devoted to. That is what you are devoted to. That is what patience and ethics demands us to do. You work with the freedom, actually the duty, to reject the restrictions of pharmaceutical development. You ignore the no entry signs that have guided health science down the less risky path of care and stubbornly insist on taking the more challenging route to cure. You refuse to give up not just because you are stubborn, but because you accept the challenge to save the lives that others have given up on. If you are embarking on a career in health cure, you remind yourself every time that you face an obstacle that your challenges pale in comparison to those of the patients you serve. You take the knocks because you can, and because you cannot walk past suffering, 
without trying and trying again to help. That is the driving force behind ARM, Intelia, and the biotech community. That is the motivation of our emerging health cure industry. And let us not underestimate the weight or urgency of our duty. Whether you are a scientist, entrepreneur, or legislator, accepting the status quo is a luxury you do not have. History will not forgive delays and missed opportunities to end human suffering. But perseverance in building a new health cure ecosystem and the foundation of science will ripple through history and across geography. Thank you all very much. Nesson, thank you very much for that very poignant message. So, not out of health, well, into health cures, right? So that's what we're all about. Thank you very much. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker this evening. Um, she is Dr. Karen Hehenberger, and I've known her for a number of years. Karen and I first met, uh, I think, really right after we began ARM in 2009, 2010. She was, at that point, working for J&J, &J, and then shortly thereafter left J&J &J to go to JDRF to, I think, run their first investment fund. And Karen was one of the ones who really understood what we were trying to do. She understood the importance of uh, our commitment to the patients, to all of the stakeholders in this space, and, and how we need to work together uh, to really achieve the outcomes that we're looking for. And she's really dedicated her life to that, and you're, and you're going to hear about that in her talk this evening. You have in your program uh, uh, her bio, but I'm just going to mention a few things. Uh, she founded and launched LifeWall, the organization that she's currently running, in 2014. And this is after 20 years, really, in the sector. She began by completing her MD and PhD, so you're one of those, the MDs and PhDs, uh, from Karolinska Institute and has done a number of other things. I'll just mention a few. She's held leadership positions in the biopharmaceutical industry. Uh, I mentioned J&J, &J, iTech Pharmaceuticals, at Coronado Biosciences, and then also on the investment side of the sector. She also has done a TEDx talk, which I recommend to all of you. She claims it wasn't her best, but I disagree. Um, but that's something you can find on YouTube, and you should check that out. She has also published a book called The Everything You Need to Know About Diabetes Cookbook. Did we have any of those dishes this evening? No. <laughs> but, uh, but she's done a tremendous amount. I even hear she dances and sings a little bit as well, but no, maybe not. She's done it all. She's a wonderful person. We're delighted to have her here. So, Karen, I'd like to introduce you on stage. Thank you so much, uh, Maury, and thank you uh, for inviting me here tonight. Thank you for inviting me to the conference, and uh, I really, really enjoyed uh, the session today and uh, learned much during the day. I think this is the last slide of the presentation, so if we can go to the first one. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. So. Um, I'm here today uh, to really talk about uh, my own experience and what drove me, um, a person who was uh, diagnosed with type 1 diabetes as a teenager, and that really drove me to pursue medical science. But more importantly, 20 years after the diagnosis, I realized that the lived experience, uh, being a patient with a chronic disease, Really, that experience needs to be harnessed when it comes to conquering the crisis that we're facing when it comes to chronic disease, both on the economy and on uh, patients' lives. It's crippling, it's killing people, and it's hurting our economy. And unless we can harness the passion, but also the innovative experiences and the drive from those living with chronic disease on a daily basis, I believe we are lacking as leaders, scientists, and business people within this industry. 
And that's really the basis for forming Lifebulb. So our vision is to improve the quality of life for those living with chronic disease, and in particular diabetes, because it's a personal passion of mine, not only because I'm diagnosed with the disease, but also because I'm studied, I've studied it extensively, as I will, I will discuss. And we do this by bridging patient communities with industry and really trying to articulate the voice of the patient in an intelligent way and in a communicative way so that we're not being antagonistic to wood industry because I believe and my partners believe that industry and the investment community are what we need to partner with to deliver better products to market which will help us all live better with these chronic diseases. So we've co-founded uh, Lifebulb. I co-founded Lifebulb together with two great, great people I wish could be here tonight. Uh, Steve Squinto, who's a um, co-founder of Alexion, a great, great orphan disease company. He's currently in Israel at Biomet, but he sends his regards. And currently with Orbimed as a venture partner. And my other co-founder, Ricardo Braglia, who's the uh, CEO of an oncology company called Helsin. What is common for all three of us is that we come with a heavy training within the pharmaceutical industry, but also with a great passion for uh, people living with chronic disease because we've experienced it either directly or indirectly. And I do not want to be elitist in the sense that if you're not a patient, you do not understand chronic disease. I think it's equally important to be a relative to someone, to live with someone with chronic disease, to be directly impacted by that because that's how you learn and that's how you see the daily problems with the disease. So again, we are focused on bridging the communities with industry. And we do this through, I would say, at least three different ways. One, obviously creating a great network where people, where we see ourselves as a connector. We cannot do everything, but we are very much trying to connect people to the right organizations. Two, uh, which I think is our, our key asset, is that we really, really try to harness the experience of those who are living with chronic disease or are directly related. And we call them patient entrepreneurs. Uh, one could also call it a lived experience or experiential entrepreneurs. Most entrepreneurs are driven by the passion of uh, conquering something running a marathon or uh, climbing a mountain or winning, which I clearly understand because I'm also a competitive person. But uh, the other thing that is very important is that when you are facing a chronic disease or a disease that is threatening to really change your life, you are driven by something in addition to that. And that kind of drive is really, really important to be able to take into consideration when you're building a company. Um, the passion and the drive is one thing, but the other thing is that experiential uh, uh, knowledge. When you look at the experience of a patient, that experience uh, may be very different versus when you're facing that person in the uh, um, doctor's office or when you're studying it as a mechanism of action as a scientist. And I think it's very, very important to understand the daily struggles of someone who's living with chronic disease. And that is really what we're trying to harness through our patient entrepreneurs. The uh, most recent venture that we're also embarking upon beyond the connectivity and beyond the patient entrepreneurs is to be launching a very focused fund that is investing in autoimmune disease and with a particular emphasis on type 1 diabetes where we think there's a lot to be done in immunology and regenerative medicine. So just as a reminder, obviously chronic disease uh, affects about 50% of the population and when you have one chronic disease you often have one more. Uh, this is not uh, an, an area where it's an isolated situation, especially with autoimmune disease where people are often afflicted with uh, many more diseases than just one and it causes a lot of um, uh, suffering as well as economic consequences. Diabetes, you know it's a global pandemic. It's a 
pandemic that is not just a lifestyle disease, but it really, really affects you. It affects you on a daily basis. Um, I believe that the statistics say that as a person living with diabetes, you have to make at least 200 or maybe 300 extra decisions on a daily basis. Just this dinner that we just had would have been quite complicated as a person with diabetes. Not just on the uh, ways you dose your drugs that you have to take to, be, to survive, but also how that makes you feel. And that's, that's exactly the point of the experiential uh, knowledge that we try to include in our assessment of what is really going to be valuable in the marketplace. So back to why I'm so motivated by this and what, what happened to me and uh, what happened when, when I was a young, young girl uh, back in, uh, in Sweden. <laughs> So um, I grew up, as I said, in Sweden, and I uh, uh, was a very successful athlete at the time, and um, uh, actually played on the Swedish national tennis team. I'm not sure about the singing and dancing, but I can play really, really good tennis. <laughs> and uh, uh, nothing really could have prepared me for the diagnosis of a chronic disease, type 1 diabetes, at the age of 16. It really crushed my world. I think at that time, you really see yourself as invincible. And in my case, my focus was uh, sports. And I uh, did my schoolwork, and I was very good at it, but I didn't spend as much time on that as I did on, on, uh, on my athletic abilities. Um, so when I was diagnosed with uh, type 1 diabetes, I knew that uh, my life was going to change because I was not going to see this as a way of uh, disrupting my, my, my life. So I made two decisions. One was I was going to find a cure for this disease, which meant that I was going to study medicine and do science. Um, and the second one that I was not going to let anyone in on the fact that I had uh, this handicap. So I spent the next 20 years working uh, as uh, an investor, working as uh, an executive, and, and really conquering the world as a, as a young adult, um, doing a very successful IPO in 2004 together with my colleagues at iTech, working at McKinsey, uh, doing my postdoc at Harvard Medical School, and no one, no one knew I had type 1 diabetes because that was not part of my image. And, and that, that really hurt me. It really hurt me from, I would say, two angles. One, physically. Uh, it uh, didn't last for more than 20 years. Um, after 20 years, I was faced, actually just at the time when I met Maury, I was faced with the decision either to go on dialysis or uh, find myself a kidney because my kidneys were done. Uh, my eyes were also completely done, so I needed to use the very, old, the very, very same treatment that I was uh, very much part of to get to the market, Macugen for iTech. I essentially used Avastin because it was less expensive, but uh, <laughs> uh, it saved my vision which was very important. It saved my vision, but right now it's, um, uh, it's a vision that is clearly laser pointed and um, I, my diabetes really, really um, um, destroyed much of my, my body. I found a kidney because my father was an incredible or is an incredible man and uh, he did not question the, um, uh, this decision at all and uh, offered me one of his kidneys and um, a month after diagnosis with, uh, by the doctors telling me either dialysis or a kidney transplant, uh, we were on the table at Columbia Presbyterian and um, uh, we, we did the transplant. Nine months later, I did a pancreas transplant. And this is the 1.0 of what we're doing here. The pancreas transplant is a cure, but it is a cure that also involves um, immunosuppressants. In my case, I really didn't see that as something that I even questioned to do because I already had the kidney transplant. There would be no difference in therapy and I saw myself still somewhat invincible that I would not die in the surgery and I had a great surgeon, David Sutherland from Minnesota, who'd done a thousand transplants of a, a pancreas at the time while in New York where I lived, they'd done two. So I traveled to Minnesota, I did my pancreas transplant in January of 2010 and since then I've not injected one dose of insulin 
seven years later. So that's a remarkable, remarkable cure. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I hope it lasts. Uh, the point is that this, this um, cannot happen to everyone. It happened to me because I was unfortunate enough to have a very aggressive kind of type 1 diabetes and I lived a very aggressive life where my uh, blood sugar control was not optimal um, and um, uh, the combination made me very susceptible to microvascular disease. And I was in a good spot because I was relatively young and I had great medical care and I received these two transplants. But not everyone can get there. And uh, that's why I'm so motivated to find treatments that are applicable to a very large population and can help everyone live a better life with, uh, without diabetes and other autoimmune diseases. Um, it was not until I received the pancreas transplant that I realized how bad this disease is. Because I had got so used to living with type 1 diabetes that I didn't even question how bad I felt. Suddenly, after about, it took, it took a few, it took maybe two months after the pancreas transplant until I was you know, up and going again. I was back at J&J &J within actually eight weeks. But I, I felt so different. It suddenly gave me an opportunity to enjoy life, not just to work through life. Because I'd already decided at the age of 16 that my life was going to be committed to science, to medicine, and to, to really do well. But um, 20 years later, I realized that I also deserved to actually maybe dance and sing a little bit. <laughs> and it made me a much, uh, much better person. So beyond everything that we're doing uh, to cure disease, to treat symptoms, we will also give people much happier lives. And everyone who is here, who does not have a chronic disease, beyond you know, not having to inject or take pills or, or feel the side effects, we should also be incredibly grateful to wake up and feel good, feel happy. Because that's what life is really about. And I think we should remember that each day, even in this miserable you know, this world that we're living in right now when there's so much happening every day. I mean, I'm so uh, horrible what happened even yesterday. So uh, I, I do think we need to cherish the moments. So um, I think that is one of the main drivers for what we're trying to do with Lifebulb, is to bring back that live life, take charge of your future to turn your life on, which is one of our expressions. Um, so if you are someone living with chronic disease, or if you are motivated by someone with chronic disease, you can get involved. That's, that's really our message. We cannot just sit back and wait for brilliant scientists, businessmen and women, and doctors to fix it for us. We need to get involved. Our positioning, we can't do everything. We are now working very much in trying to embrace the patient entrepreneurs and to, uh, we cr created this new fund, T1D Capital. But even if you're not entrepreneurially inclined, you can be a speaker, you can be an advocate, you can be a, a public person who really makes a difference. I think everyone has a role. And uh, when you have a responsibility, when you take accountability for your own situation, I think we all feel so much better. So with that, I'd like to thank you all and uh, wish uh, uh, a wonderful uh, end of evening. Thank you. Good evening, I'm uh, Bruce Levine. I'm the Barbara and Edward Netter Professor in Cancer Gene Therapy at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and I'm just a scientist sandwiched in between two very remarkable stories. Uh, and I want to draw your attention to someone many of you may have heard of, and that is Angela Duckworth, uh, who is a professor of psychology and a 
MacArthur Genius Fellow and author of the New York Times bestseller, Grit. Uh, and Grit is the story of the power of passion and perseverance. And I believe our previous speaker and our next speaker uh, both have that. And, and Dr. Duckworth's specialty is uh, research on the psychology of achievement. Uh, and she studied the Green Berets, um, the winners of the National Spelling Bee, and, and many others. And the common denominator uh, of these uh, people uh, that have grit is not just their perseverance, but their passion. Uh, and we certainly just uh, heard that. Uh, self-control and stick to uh, And she also says that anyone can learn and culture grit, and I think that's the value of having speakers uh, like we have tonight so that we can take that uh, inspiration back. Uh, Nicole Gallarte, who will uh, speak next, uh, uh, is a, a patient that came to the University of Pennsylvania uh, with multiple relapsed acute lymphoid leukemia and was treated with her own chimeric antigen receptor T cells uh, just this past uh, September. Uh, she is tenacious, uh, she is compassionate, uh, she is a 5X extrovert, and I'm sure uh, she would be happy to uh, Facebook friend everyone in this room. Uh, and she is a seven time uh, cancer survivor, and I'm proud to call her a dear friend. So, Nicole, would you come up and share your story? That was dead on. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you for um, having me here tonight. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's been a while since I've given a talk, <laughs> too, so I'm a little, a little nervous, um, especially with um, this audience. Uh, Let's see, so I will um, begin by just kind of going in chronological order with um, my story, which is quite close to our previous speaker. Um, but I was uh, diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia in 2010, uh, fresh out of grad school. And so I went from my very nice, uh, you know, one bedroom condo in LA um, with a nice salary and freedom to spending seven, oh, seven months off and on in the hospital, followed by two and a half years of being in and out, daily treatment, therapy, side effects. Um, so it was not a pleasant time. However, I had a lot of friends and great supporters. Um, so I was, I was uh, at Stanford for my traditional uh, CalBG trial, which is uh, the standard um, form of treatment for most patients with leukemia. Um, the, the actual um, statistics on the survival rate um, of a patient, adult patient with ALL uh, among five years is in the 30 to 50% range. I didn't know that at the time I was getting my treatment, but um, when you relapse, if you do, then you always relapse unless you have a transplant, a bone marrow transplant. And uh, I relapsed in, in 2014, April, and I had gone back to Stanford, uh, obviously. Uh, they you know, were trying to insert another pick line and wanted to immediately put me uh, in, um, for bone marrow transplant, and I said, well, no, 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 
I don't want to do a bone marrow transplant. Like that, that's worse than what I, I just spent three years of my life doing. And the side effects from that, I can't recover from. So I'm not doing a bone marrow transplant. There must be something else. This is Stanford. And uh, <laughs> so my current doctor uh, said, well, no, Nicole, there really isn't anything else. This has been the standard uh, treatment for 30 plus years. So, you know, this is it, this is it. And that, that's, this is what you get. And uh, his colleague, uh, who is my current Stanford doctor, um, <laughs> uh, she, she said, well, what about CAR T cell to him? And she's looking at him, and I'm in the hospital bed just looking at the both of them. And he goes, what, no? And I said, well, what's CAR T cell? And she said, well, I thought that, that might be coming over. And I said, well, what's CAR T cell? You know, because they're sitting here arguing about it in front of me. I want to know what it is. This applies to me. And so my, my doctor, um, the current at the time, not current today, <laughs> said, uh, Nicole, you know, don't, don't even think about looking it up or doing any research. You're never going to see it in your lifetime. It's just not going to happen. It was supposed to be here a year ago. Um, it hasn't made any progress. Don't even, just don't even go there. And I said, okay, well, <clears throat> I'm gonna have to check out of the hospital because I've got two doctors at Stanford kind of arguing or not agreeing on the type of treatment and this is my life. So if you guys can't agree on it, then I've obviously got to take this into my own hands and, and, and do the research um, and make my own decisions. And I, I just knew that I did not want to go through a bone marrow transplant, whether I had a 10 out of 10 match or not. Um, you know, I had a great life, traveled a lot, no kids, single, uh, already had three and a half years of treatment, didn't care to go through it again. Um, so I checked out of the hospital and I think that was the first time I'd seen my doctor um, at the time shed a tear and he said, Nicole, you do realize what's going to happen if you don't get treatment. And I said, oh, I, I'm well aware. I do understand. But this is where I, I, you know, I haven't done any research on my disease ever. It's been three and a half years. Now it's time for me to, to do the research. So um, I went home and plugged and chugged on that computer and I spent the next, well, I haven't stopped, um, doing research. Um, it, the time that I relapsed was a very transformational time in, in medical research. Um, I knew nothing about anything. Um, and so I feel like part of this was luck, but it was also, um, I don't know, it was meant to be. Uh, I had looked into the CAR-T, uh, the FDA closed the trial, Emily Whitehead, um, I, I had not heard about at the time yet. Um, I was just focused on the one trial that was open. Uh, again, this is uh, April 2014, so close to the end of April 2014. And uh, I got a call, because I knew, you know, if you have ALL, you can't really delay, you don't want to delay too much time. So I got a call from the, my current doctor uh, at Stanford. She, she said, Nicole, you know, I've got this trial that just opened up. Um, it's a Pfizer drug, uh, inotuzumab. It's an antibody. Um, it, the computer, it's, it's randomized. Uh, you know, we're not allowed to select our patients. But uh, if you get the drug, there's a chance that you won't go through three years of treatment. But it will only bridge. It's temporary. It's not lasting. It will only bridge your way to transplant. And I said, well, but uh, could it potentially, even though the FDA had closed the adult CAR T cell trial at UPenn, uh, could it potentially bridge me to CAR T cell? And she followed my train of thought and was basically my only, only supporter in the healthcare um, field. No nurses, no, no doctors, no one believed that I would ever make it out of Stanford. <laughs> so uh, she, she, uh, I, she had not convinced me. I 
did a little bit of research and I decided, well, you know, I, time is not on my side, so I'll go ahead and check in and hopes that I get the drug. And uh, if, if I was not selected for the drug, although I couldn't relay this to my doctor at the time, I would have just dropped out of the study um, because I would not have gone and got the treatment. And I did have a perfect unrelated uh, donor. I did. Um, but I still didn't want that because the outcome isn't, it, your quality of life is highly diminished. My quality of life already has been or was diminished for, you know, that the, after the three years of treatment. So I checked in the hospital. I got selected for control arm A, got the inotuzumab, um, felt a little sick, feverish, chills for about two days, and it was mandatory I had to stay in the hospital for for I, I believe it was three weeks, 21 to 20, 21 to 30 days. Uh, day two, uh, probably day three, more realistically, um, <clears throat> I felt so good. And my team of doctors came in and I said, I feel good. And they said, well, the leukemia cells have diminished. This, it's working. Um, I said, well, can I go home? Like, no, 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 we have to monitor you. Okay. So the next day, I, I was so bored, I ordered an elliptical and had it uh, set up in my hospital room. Um, and I'm on my elliptical, you know, they made me get one with a seat, just in case, you know, they don't want you falling. So I'm on my elliptical and I'm playing Candy Crush Saga, listening to my iTunes, and the, t the team of, of doctors come in and and their, their jaws just hit the floor and I mean a couple of them probably teared up and they're like this is what we work our whole lives for to, to, to be able to see a patient go from being detrimentally sick to in two days your, your, your cancer is almost gone and you're, you're active your, your nails are still there your hair is still there it's, it was phenomenal um, I, I wanted to go home that day, and, and I, I mean, it felt wonderful. Uh, and and it, I didn't, there were, there were no real side effects. Uh, today, there's probably a few, um, like menopause. I think that one knocked me in early menopause, actually. Um, but I checked out of the hospital, I was released um, after three weeks, and they did keep me there the whole time, dang it. Um, but I was, you know, in really good shape. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I talked to my doctor, and you know, my current doctor. She, she, I'll say her name because she's wonderful, and, and she won't mind. Uh, Michaela Lecky, she's from Germany. Um, she, she, she said, I said, uh, realistically, how much time do I have? Um, I, I was trying to reach out to to UPenn, and the FDA still had closed the trial. Um, for the adults, and um, it was the only one, uh, and they were not answering their phones. So she said, you know, um, two and a half to three months, and you should have a full bone marrow relapse. And I said, okay, okay. And she goes, but I do recommend, and I'll give you a letter. I can't really do much else than that, but I recommend you going out there and let, let them see how healthy you are after this relapse. And so I, I, I said, okay. You know, I went and kind of hopped around Europe a little bit and with some friends and family. And I mean, that's how good I felt. Like not even a month in remission, full remission from a relapse of acute lymphoblastic leukemia and I'm hiking in Spain. So uh, yeah, it, it was just phenomenal. Um, I came back and after probably like six attempts uh, or no's from UPenn about seeing the PI, um, I finally said, look, um, you need to take me seriously. I, I'm turning down a perfect uh, donor uh, for transplant in order to allow myself to relapse so that I can qualify for your trial. And it's not even open by the FDA and I don't know if it will be. So please take me seriously. I want an appointment with the PI, and I deserve that. I have that right. And uh, they finally said yes, and um, the next week I was out there, and 
my current doctor from UPenn, uh, bless her heart, uh, she, she, uh, she said, well, Nicole, uh, why are you out here? Can you please tell me? And so I started uh, from the beginning, and uh, after 15 minutes, she said, I believe you've made a very well-informed decision. And um, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to set you up with uh, Dr. Siegel, and we're going to go ahead and collect your T cells while they're healthy. And that way we can store them, and if or when you do relapse, you know, we'll, we won't have to get them from you then. We'll, we can go ahead and start manufacturing them. And I was like, great, perfect, thank you. And so the next day I went into the apheresis unit. I hadn't met Bruce yet. Um, I met him on my second trip out to UPenn, but I met Don Siegel who showed me the Emily Whitehead video and uh, talked to me about how Novartis had um, basically funded uh, the vast majority of the initial research um, which got that facility up and running and they showed me the two beds that they had where they would collect the T cells and then he gave my mom and I the behind the scenes tour uh, which was a whole another laboratory and today I think that's been um, increased tenfold but you know at the time it was just a very tiny facility still under construction um, I saw how passionate these doctors were, and I didn't meet Carl June at that time either, but Don Siegel, who's, um, he's the director of laboratory medicine and pathology? Transfusion medicine, okay. <laughs> so Don Siegel, I, I, he's, he, he just was so passionate, and after seeing the video of Emily Whitehead, and tearing up, I was so inspired that I didn't care if I ended up getting the treatment. I didn't care if the FDA was gonna open it or not. I didn't care if, um, I didn't care, what I knew, I didn't care about that transplant. I didn't care about anything else. I knew that I wanted to be a part of this and that it was something that was going to be meaningful because I saw the passion and I saw the behind the scenes and so I went home on that flight knowing that no matter what the outcome was that I wanted to be a part of it I wanted to be a part of it and so I went back to Stanford and I think I was due for a transplant that following uh, week and I said send your donor home I, I, I made a decision and this is probably August, uh, so August 2014. Um, I was to sit around and wait for the FDA to open the trial and wait for a bone marrow relapse, and that didn't happen for a year. Well, the bone marrow relapse didn't happen for a year. Um, instead, I relapsed everywhere else. Uh, isolated CNS went to my eyes. Um, during that period, I watched CAR T cell open up um, I also advocated, I went and gave speeches um, and, you know, pushed for uh, the FDA to open these trials and uh, educating other patients um, through sharing my story and then I was really kind of lost because there was no end to my story yet. <laughs> um, but it was hard for me to see this medicine start working for other cancers as well. Uh, Carter got, he had stage four melanoma in 2015 and um, was given his own T cells and what, three, four weeks, cured, gone. Today he's fine. Um, you know, to be able to, to, to see that happen, um, but not be part of it, I was still okay with it. I, I still was, I was very happy with my decision, especially because I got to watch it unfold. And not just for leukemia, but for, um, other cancers and, and diseases. So it was something that, you know, I just continued to go along with it. And uh, <clears throat> eventually, uh, I, I didn't relapse in the bone marrow, so I didn't qualify for the trial uh, for until 2016. Um, I had relapsed multiple times in the spine, CNS, lost my vision, had multiple surgeries, radiation, uh, chemotherapy, I think I had, um, I've had over 250 lumbar punctures. Um, 
at one point, you know, I lost my mind and uh, was kicked out of, well, was told I couldn't even live alone. So I not only had my career taken from me, my health taken from me, my vision taken from me, my car taken from me, but I had my home taken from me because I wasn't able to even cook or get out of bed. And so I, we really thought that I was going to pass. Um, there was a couple of times where, okay, Nicole, maybe you have like six weeks. Um, eventually, in uh, April 2016, I, I did go on hospice. Um, it, the treatment just wasn't getting rid of it. I had full active CNS disease um, and the isolated to the eyes. Um, it, without, I had to be clear in order to qualify for the trial at UPenn. Now, Juno Therapeutics uh, actually opened up their first trial at um, Seattle, and this, most of you might find this a little interesting. Uh, my Stanford doctor, Michaela, she says, Nicole, you know, I know, I know you're, you know, very, you're all about UPenn and the Novartis trial, but Seattle will accept patients who have CNS disease. So you might want to think about going out there, and, and even though it's not the same, you know, it's, it's, it's treatment. And so I called them, and uh, they didn't, they were okay. They wanted to, uh, they were going to let me fly out there and meet with the PI until they learned that my healthy T-cells were already collected and were stored at UPenn. And I think Juno and Novartis were um, in a, they were in litigation, and so they said, no, we can't accept you into our trial, so bye. And so that, it was shortly after that, I went on to hospice. And I was given three weeks. And the cancer was in my blood, bone marrow, uh, lymph nodes, uh, CNS. It was everywhere. Um, so three weeks, I had never been baptized. I was planning my funeral. I wanted to um, be buried next to my father. And um, I had a very lovely three weeks. And at the end of the three weeks, I felt I felt kind of like I do today. <laughs> and so I thought, well, this doesn't feel like the end of three weeks, end of life. So I went to Stanford and they took a blood test and I had been off of chemo and, and no blood products for, for five weeks, which is unheard of. And they said, yeah, you look normal. This is, this is odd. Will you go get another lumbar puncture? So that way we can see if your CNS is is clear and I mean we all knew that you know, there's no way it was going to be clear. Um, the next day I, I think it was the first time Stanford ever had the test results back within an hour. Um, it was clear. It was clear. So my cancer without any kind of treatment was all gone. It wasn't showing, I mean we weren't going to do a, a bone marrow biopsy. Um, it would have come back positive regardless but uh, you know, as far as the blood and, and the CNS, I qualified for that UPenn trial. And the next, uh, I think it was you know, that following Monday, I was on a flight and I flew out to UPenn. And um, Bruce continued modifying or manufacturing my, my T cells. And um, I entered the trial on September, beginning of the first week of September, I was given my T cells, uh, September 5th. And in 28 days, I was considered cancer free. We're all gone. <laughs> and then, and then, a lot of thank you, thank you. Um, a lot of people, or a lot of, um, sorry, I, I so spaced what I was going to say right there. <laughs> um, I was thinking about how uh, um, a lot of people oh, will ask me. They'll ask me about my side effects from all this chemo for five, I've been fighting for what, seven years? Um, six and a half years, technically. Uh, so my side effects from all the chemo is osteoporosis. I've had two bilateral knee surgeries. Uh, I'm due for a third, um, but there's stem cells for that now. Um, <laughs> my, my new slogan is, uh, don't worry, there's a cure for that. <laughs> don't worry, there's a cure for that too. Um, so uh, all these nasty side effects. I, I was lucky to even have regained my vision. I was blind for a while, um, but I regained the vision. But it was I was colorblind. It was very distorted, so I couldn't really drive. Still, anyhow, when I had entered my trial at UPenn, I got my CAR T cells, and um, 
on day six or seven, I was watching TV and I had this colorful, which didn't seem that colorful to me because I was colorblind, um, border up in my room I had decorated. And you know, it's, I'm watching TV and all of a sudden this woman's very vibrant and she's wearing this bright green dress on the TV. And I look around my room and this border was um, neon, orange, yellow, green, blue, and I thought, what the heck? So I looked at my, my friend who was uh, next to me and I said, I just got my color vision back. And uh, so, yeah, that's my side effect from my own T cells. My side effect was getting my color vision back and my, some of my vision completely restored um, because, it, you know, it was a lot of uh, scar tissue. Uh, um, it's better. I can drive. I can see. I still have to have surgery done eventually, but um, I regained uh, my vision, which was impossible at the time. So, um, yeah, that's the greatest part of that story. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I'm going to end um, with this. Uh, <clears throat> without the team at UPenn, I would not be here. I wouldn't have received my treatment. They, they have enabled me and my friends, my family to, to indulge and participate and share and um, post stuff on social media all I want. <laughs> um, I mean, I go out to UPenn for my visits and I, I'm in the laboratory looking at CAR T cells that have just been modified under a microscope and um, I'm experiencing it like I'm one of them and they've uh, continuously made me part of their team and I, I, that was something that was a huge um, gap at Stanford and, and being in three very different clinical trials and experiencing this transformation in, in clinical medicine. Um, that, uh, the teamwork, the level of teamwork and engagement and collaboration is, is really what keeps me motivated and inspired. Um, yeah, and uh, so that's us with, uh, <laughs> that's at the Angel Ball Gala um, that Bruce had invited me to, and that's Tom and Carrie and Emily Whitehead, who's the first child in the world to ever receive her own T cells, and uh, she, on May 10th uh, was her five-year cancer-free mark, and for the first time heard from uh, Dr. Grupp that uh, your daughter's cured. So um, that, that was, uh, I'm sure, good for Tom and Carrie. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm uh, seven months, I think, out, uh, but I'm not worried if it comes back. I'm just going to go get the next best thing. <laughs> Um, and then I think I, I just I'll end with a video. Um, this is Sean Parker. <laughs> For those of you who don't know Sean Parker, he actually invented Napster, but he funded um, 200. He allocated 250 million dollars, million, correct? Okay, uh, to uh, <laughs> to um, the to UPenn. It started the um, he launched the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, and. Uh, Oh, I don't know what I, did I do that? Who's doing that? I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. I'm not doing that. Um, yeah, so he, he, he was uh, one of the primary investors and, and continues to um, <clears throat> help the, in the transformation and progress uh, of immunotherapy for not just leukemia, but all kinds of cancers and, and, and treatments. Uh, and this is the, our, our sequel, our latest um, to uh, the Fire with Fire video. Um, it's about the Emily Whitehead Foundation and how they helped me um, in my journey uh, eventually getting out to, to uh, UPenn for my CAR T-cell. Um, Okay, I'm going to go sit down. My name's Tom Whitehead, and I'm uh, co founder of the Emily Whitehead Foundation. Emily Whitehead Foundation is dedicated to helping families, children, and researchers fight cancer. 
My husband and I started the foundation in honor of our daughter, Emily. My wife and I only have one child, and she was healthy up until she turned five years old. And then we were told that uh, she had leukemia. Her leukemia was resistant to treatment. As parents, it just you know, slowly destroys you inside. 16 months into Emily's treatment, she relapsed. We did another month of chemotherapy, trying to get her back into remission, which was not successful. And the doctor at Hershey said, we're, we're done. We don't have any more weapons to fight Emily's cancer, so we'll set up hospice for you. It just made us want to fight even harder, and we were willing to do whatever it took to find Emily a treatment. She ended up becoming the first child in the world in the T-cell therapy trial to have her immune system trained to fight cancer. Emily is now four and a half years cancer-free after T-cell therapy. When Emily got home and, and she was doing good, I felt like we had a new calling for what we were supposed to do in life, and it eventually turned into, hey, we should start our own foundation. We created the Emily Whitehead Foundation to fund T-cell research for pediatric cancer, and we also want to raise awareness for childhood cancer as well as cancer research and immunotherapy treatments. We just do whatever it takes to help others have the same success that we do. The McMahon family from Atlanta called me and said, our son, Connor's 15 years old, he's a hockey player. He was on his third relapse and, and his life was at risk. And he looked at me and said, I want to get that treatment that Emily got. Connor entered the trial. When they found out Connor was cancer free, uh, I was the first person. They called. So that's why I keep doing it. I was actually planning my own funeral and given three weeks left to live when I first reached out to them. And Tom and Carrie welcomed my call and I think every day we talked and they helped in some way uh, to get me out there and get treatment. I said, um, if you want to continue to fight, I'll do anything in our power to help you get there. She got into the trial, 28 days later, she was cancer free and remains that way today. I went from planning my own funeral with only a few weeks left to live to being cancer free in less than two months. Nicole was really an amazing person. She's very inspirational. She loves to share her story. She loves to help the patients as well. It really made my day when Nicole called me and said that she had nominated us for the Life Science of Pennsylvania Patient Impact Award. They constantly help other families and patients that have had similar situations to my story and Emily's. And um, it's an organization that's really focused on helping others and paying it forward. So I'd like to thank um, our speakers tonight, um, particularly um, Karn and Nicole for uh, really their inspiring talks um, and being willing really to talk about such personal um, details of their life and sharing that with us. And I think it's uh, just a great reminder of why we all do what we do every day um, to work in this field. And you heard Nesson at the beginning talk about how when he's Running, he th you know, when he's going up a hill, he thinks about he thinks about patients. And I was thinking as I was listening that um, just to borrow from that a little bit for our experience here tomorrow, in a small way, as all of you are kind of trudging up Capitol Hill and walking through offices and dealing with security lines and uh, all of those little hassles uh, that happen. I think we can be thinking about the speakers we heard tonight and all the others that um, were trying to help. So um, with that, two bits of details. Uh, in terms of tomorrow, if you are a board member of ARM, and you know who you are, and more importantly, we know who you are, um, our meeting starts at 7. It's in the Crystal Room, which is the room next door where we had our cocktail hour, though I can't promise there will be cocktails. Um, but that starts at 7. If you are not, the breakfast and the briefing where you can 
um, get something to eat and uh, kind of deal with final logistics and get your schedule straight if you don't have it. That also starts at seven, and that will be on the second floor in a room called in a in a room called the Nest. I'm not kidding. Um, so that's on the second floor. Uh, and with that, thank you all for coming to our dinner tonight. Thank you for coming to the fly-in tomorrow. Have a great day, and have a great day, and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>